Aloha and welcome to a special edition of Spotlight Now with students from Kamehameha School's Kapalama campus. You know, we're really excited for this show because they've selected the topics that are important to them and we'll be interviewing our special guests. Joining us now are seniors Kaden Ito and Lena Alawang. Aloha and thanks for joining us. Thank you so Aloha, much for having you. us. Yeah, we are so excited about what you're bringing to us today. Lena Ala, why did you think it was important to include fresh perspectives from students for this show? Well, it's super important to include fresh perspectives like us students because we are figuring out who we are now and our opinions, our viewpoints, and we're going to be those who lead their, our future generations and so being able to create a safe environment right now um, to uproot and upbring a healthy society in the future is, is really important. And Kaden, how about for you? You're going to be able to help uh, drive this conversation as the host. Uh, how, does, what is that uh, how is this important to you uh, and why is it important for you folks to be part of this conversation? I think driving this conversation and being a viewpoint and being just a speaker for our generation as a whole gets us a jump start into our community and into our future lives. You guys were giving free reign and you could choose whatever topics you wanted. The first subject you chose today is mental health. Let's hear from both of you. Lena Ala, let's start with you. Why is this such an important topic for people your age? It's really, it's an important topic because it, um, it's like a foundation to who we are and being able to balance work life, academics, for me, athletics, um, personal life, you know, uh, just having that stability is super important and having a healthy and having a st stable mental health, you know, so yeah. Okay, Caden, what are your thoughts? I believe what she was saying is just as true, just mental health affects everything in our daily lives, even, doesn't even matter how old you are, but for us as teens especially, with the new up and coming things that are happening all around us nowadays, it's really important to hone in on that. So the first half of the show, we're gonna be focusing on the topic of mental health, then you guys are gonna be uh, getting a second guest in here to talk about food sustainability. Uh, Kaden, why was this an important conversation for you folks to have? We decided on food sustainability mostly because a lot of our students don't know where our food comes from and really what they eat every day, it's really something that we need to know where our food's coming from and how much other influences as an island as a whole, how much we can sustain our own food, food processes. And Lena Ala, for you, what are you hoping to gather from this conversation? Uh, mainly just to emphasize the fact that we came from such a deeply rooted um, lifestyle of fishermen and farming and you know that system of an ahupua'a working from Moka to Makai and being able to source ourselves locally and so I think he said like a lot of our food is imported now so not knowing where it comes from if it's if it's truly healthy for us um, and our bodies. Okay we're looking forward to this thank you both for being here we are excited for the show we're going to let you two guys get started by introducing the first topic. Yeah, mahalo. Um, this is a subject important not only to us, but also our peers. So let's take a look at what they have to say. We'll start today's discussion with mental health and the challenges that are facing society, especially for our generation. From anxiety, to bullying, to the impact of social media, teens are dealing with all kinds of issues. We reached out to some of our peers for their thoughts. Let's hear what they had to say. My biggest stresses definitely are workloads, school, and like it's my social life. The school environment. So it, either if it's like homework, test, um, social life, like making friends, um, talking to your kumu. One big one for me is anxiety and pressure. Worrying about our future and having to deal with college applications and scholarship applications. Yeah, and I've experienced burnout myself. And I think that you have to kind of stay on top of your uh, mental health as you go out, go throughout the school year, because if you slip and fall, uh, no one's catching you. Starting as a freshman, some of the pressures I've experienced is the pressure of making friends in a completely new school, because everybody knows each other from like middle school. And so everybody already has their friend groups and it's kind of hard for me to like try to merge into those or find new friends of my own. Playing sports, I play volleyball, while also balancing school life can be very hard, especially if you're taking like honors classes, AP classes. With the competition of your peers with college apps coming up and still like the pressure to take all these hard AP and honors courses and get A's and succeed in everything you do, it really all builds up and makes you feel like you can collapse at any moment. There's no real solution, uh, one-way solution for everyone. Everyone experiences mental health differently. And uh, mental struggles happen for everyone. And I think everyone has a different mental struggle that they're dealing with. 
We'll start today's discussion with mental health and the challenges that are facing society, especially our generation. From anxiety to bullying to the impact of teens and social media, we really reached out and we wanted to get to know it. So Dr. Austin Seabury is joining us today, uh, and we also have Kumu Ke Kahono from our middle school. Uh, I wanted to start with you. I was really talking about some of the things that our students have said. There's always a toxic environment somewhere. What, how do we identify that? That's a really good question. And I, I would say, start with what you already know how to do, which is to kilo. So begin by looking out at that environment and assessing, what is going to be asked of me in this situation? Is this one where I know how it goes, the sequence of things? Is it going to play to my strengths? Is it one where I'm going to need to be flexible because I don't know what's coming? Or does it have a huge challenge in it somewhere that I can anticipate? And then you kilo inward. And you go, OK, how am I doing right now? Both things like, did I get enough rest? Did I eat breakfast this morning? Um, am I able to make the good words today and find that flexibility that I might need to respond to the unexpected? Or is today one of those days where I better you know, uh, stick to the stuff I know? And so lining up what's going on with what you observe out there in the world with what you observe inside of yourself, you can kind of better prepare uh, for how you're going to rise and respond to any situation that you might find yourself in. Mahalo for that. Um, and I know a lot of students, you know, don't know to kill or don't know to observe their surroundings. And so Kumuke, I want to pose this next question to you. How, as a middle school educator, are you, uh, I, I guess, sort of helping students to kill or create a healthy learning environment for themselves and not a toxic one? I think that's so important to consider because by the time we get to high school or as adults, we might have experience with to toxic environments. We might be able to navigate toxic environments. At the middle school level, we're really building an idea of what is a toxic environment. And so to really make sure that we're learning and navigating these things with the various pressures and influences of other people who might be trying to guide that conversation with us, we want to go and visit the most precious people of our community, our kupuna. And the hope is, is that when we have these more um, intellectual conversations about Kilo and all the examples that she gave, we can have simple, simple questions for the middle schooler, which is, if your kupuna were present with you, how would you act and behave? And the hope is, is that we have living treasures who are in our lives right now that we can turn to and we can see tangibly. But for those haumana who might not have those examples in their lives, we might have to stretch back to our kupuna, stretch back to the values that you mentioned earlier about the ahupua system. And when we were a thriving, abundant community, how can we think about it in that way and set ourselves up to practice those values today? So thinking, how would I act? How would I hold myself? What words would I use to describe myself and talk about myself even internally if kupuna were listening? Not even necessarily kupuna I know, but kupuna that I adore and love and believe and know existed historically and culturally. So I'm so grateful for that question. The middle schoolers need simple, simple questions to ask themselves, and that's it. What would I do if Kupuna were here? Mahalo for that. And I guess uh, for middle schoolers, because they will be transitioning into high school in the next like one or two years, there is something that he and I are experiencing right now or have experienced in the past, which is burnout, you know, as seniors we're dealing with college applications and I guess balancing all these different things. And so I just wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we, how do we notice when we are experiencing burnout even if we are in a healthy learning environment? Yeah, right? it's a really good question. And I think it, uh, my answer begins with the basic concept of as as you move through your adolescence and you're in the middle of the demands, even of middle school, when you're beginning to learn that you have to be this person in this class and then uh, pili to a different kumu in this room, especially in high school where you have these varied responsibilities and you're learning all these parts of your identity, that it's not that different than the kind of pressures that come in adulthood. And so the opportunity to learn now while you're in high school, while your environment is still really responsive to you and asking you the helpful questions, and offering you the opportunities to practice is vital. And so what do you do about burnout? Well, the sooner you can know what burnout looks like on you, the better off you'll be. Because if you have to um, wait until the environment gives you feedback that burnout is happening for you by the way that you're performing or what your friends notice in you or places where you're not able to meet the expectations you've set for yourself, then it's a lot harder than if you can notice what burnout looks like on you earlier than that. 
And so that idea of tuning in and going, you know, when I notice that I'm, um, you might be able to tell, but I talk a lot. So for me, if I notice burnout is coming, it's because I'm talking less. So I'm going to notice the things about me that are changing, and that's going to help me catch that moment sooner. Because if I have to wait till someone else tells me, hey, you OK? then it's, it's going to be maybe harder work to bring myself back to my balance again. And that's the word we're looking for there is balance. Nobody maintains perfect non-burnout status at all times. That's just really hard to do with the multiple demands of your lives. But if we're going to give ourselves that chance to go, oh, I'm a little, I'm a little this, I'm going to go like this. And for everyone, it's different. And that's why spending that time to understand yourself and what it looks like for you. And then the fun part, figuring out how to heal yourself or take care of it or stay out of the, de the, the ditch that you found yourself in last time, that's the part that's fun, is learning how you make it work for you. That's so true. I think for a lot of our student body, uh, it's become such a norm that sleeping late, missing meals, and just like being so stressed all the time is just part of high school. People always talk about the junior year being that hardest year and mm -hmm. just having piling on that workload. I think for some of our student body, the athletes especially, they have to balance the, that social life, they have to balance the academics and their sport. Mm -hmm. How would you say for, I guess, these, these kinds of students, how would you go about balancing all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that that idea that we are always trying to cultivate these different parts of, ident of our identity. Th this is who we are, and you guys are at this age that you're at right now, you really are filling in the details of who you are by living all these different parts. So it's really important that you are an athlete and a member of your ohana, that you are a member of community, that you're a member of a team. All of those are really important parts, right? And so the question, of course, is how do I do all of those um, to the best of my ability. And so one of the things that, we try, uh, that I encourage people to do is to not think of it as, I'm going to give 72% over here and 8% and over here. And let's see, that's going to give me a leftover 20. So I'll give 10% to math and 10% you know, uh, to social studies. OK. Because when we do it that way, what that does is it sort of um, makes us feel like we're out of balance and that we have to fail somewhere to succeed somewhere. And I think instead of, Maybe a, more, um, maybe a more satisfying way to do it is to say, I need to find balance in each of my kuleana, that I need to understand who I am as an athlete, which, by the way, being an athlete does a wonderful thing to do balance and maintain health, because it, by definition, has you moving your body. And in this life that we have now, where there's a lot of sort of screen time and tech focus, um, when, we are, you know, when we are cultivating and developing our minds to have that outlet to also grow our body, while learning to be a part of a team in most instances, it's really, really strengthening. So what we don't want to do is say it's an either or thing. We see our, our ola, our well-being and our life in the balance. And so how do I balance myself as an athlete? How do I balance myself as a scholar? How about as a member of my ohana? How about in the way that I participate and serve my, my lahui? And so all of those are pieces, I think, of finding balance instead of one at a time, where they might have to compete with each other. Mahalo for that. And I just wanted to ask Kumu Kate, how are you as a middle school educator sort of cultivating this healthy environment where, you know, middle schoolers now are able to, I guess, balance those facets of their life so that by the time they get to high school, it's an easier transition for them? And so I think that word balance is key to us as Kanaka and as clinicians. And so what I try to do is create an environment, not only where we can look at balance, but we can look at safety. We can look at feeling comfortable. We can look at uh, un being unconditionally accepted. And so a lot of the questions that I craft and offer are balanced in themselves. One of the ones that I ask all the time is, how are you going to celebrate yourself no matter the outcome? Mm -hmm. So that the outcome isn't contingent on a grade or on a performance or even on praise from an outside source. It's contingent on you existing, you being a part of, you participating. And so that allows this whole other view of self to be a part of the conversation. And they get to think of themselves to be allowing themselves to celebrate themselves. And burnout is so tempting because we want to push, push, push. We're conditioned to push, push, push. But when we have safe adults who ask those balanced questions, it gives us room to be who we are and to not feel like we have to 
to be something other than what we have and what we can do and what we can achieve. And I also always want to create an environment where I'm going to celebrate you and I'm going to make sure that you feel that there is something that you can strive towards. So balance is not something that we just achieve and then we have arrived at balance. Balance mm -hmm. is a mentality. To be Pono is what we strive towards. We don't just arrive there. It's a daily 24 hours we get a new opportunity. And so I also remind that, that I'm going to care about you and you get to care about yourself no matter what. But we get to always return to balance. We get to always return to wellness. We get a little off with sickness and with imbalance, but natural state for the Kanaka is wellness, is to be balanced. But we know that opportunities are going to go another way, but I'll care about you throughout all of that. I would say that's so true, what you're saying about these kids who really need to know that they have these places to go to and really it's where to look for to, to, for help and just how to get a better start in their life and especially going into that high school career. Uh, before we continue our discussion, let's hear some more about some students and their feelings on how social media affects their mental health. Take a look at this. I think social media is positive and negative in different circumstances. Because I'm bad at talking in person, but I'm fine with talking on the phone and stuff. So I feel like it kind of helps me make friends online and then I can like take that and start talking to them in person at school. You know, you scroll on Insta Instagram, TikTok, you see all these other people, oh, I want to look like this, or I want to do this, I want to be this. You're looking at how many followers you have, you're looking at oh, what are my friends doing? Am I missing out on anything because my friends have posted it online and I wasn't invited to it? I honestly think that social media and our phones can be a really big negative. When our parents say, it's probably your phone, it probably is your phone. It causes me to procrastinate a lot, so it makes us get more stressed because we're worrying on catching up with other things. In some ways, it can like hurt teenagers like self-image as social media isn't always what it is and we're constantly comparing one another bringing ourselves down when we should all be content with who we are um, so the next question I wanted to ask uh, you mentioned finding uh, like the screen time and how we're in this new age of technology and then you mentioned finding and keeping a deep connection with people, whether it be friends, family, or teachers. And so, Kumke, I wanted to ask you, what are some things that you noticed down at the middle school with students coming from COVID and you know, being back in this face-to-face -face environment of learning and, and how we can create deeper connections with one another instead of through a screen? I love the word connection. And so for during a certain time, connection was about distance and that we had to kind of retrain ourselves that safety meant you know, staying apart. And so for the middle schooler, now that the expe expectation has shifted and they can come together physically, we want to make sure that they understand why that's happening. And so a lot of what I offer and what I encourage people to think of internally and externally is how come? And so when we are encouraging them to do something that we were discouraging, we explain the how come. We want to connect with our haumana. We get the opportunity to enjoy each other's company. And so it was brought up earlier um, in a conversation about middle school has walls that we put up and we can break those down. So something as simple as breaking down a physical barrier, we can articulate that and say we get to connect with each other and break this wall down and be together. And so again, when we are figuring out connection, it's not as simple as, oh, we know we just want to be together. We have to create that environment, support that environment, and then offer encouragement when we see that naturally happening again in the Haumana. And just time and place. This is the time you're on the screen. This is the time you get to connect and be close to each other again and what a true blessing that is now that we are safe enough you are safe you can do it I think that's so so vivid that on our screens that we've been on the screen so much now even though it's not something we're on 24 7 mm -hmm. I think that through the screen it's so hard to create these lasting friendships with people and especially as a, as a young kid coming up you really can't find any safe places for that um, I would ask you both this question, Dr. Seabury, I'll start with you. Uh, for that, how do we deepen those friendships with people, even though like we're over the screen but now transitioning to real life? How do we deepen those in-person connections? That's a great question. I, for, for us, 
at the age that you guys are talking about, right? Folks that are transitioning into adulthood. Mm -hmm. One of the most important aspects of your development at this time, of your identity and who you are, is how you connect to other people. Whether that's your peers, whether that's your ohana, your kumu, your kupuna, how you lean into each of the, those describes a lot of who you are. And so it's really um, important that each person know who they are, what is their style, um, what kind of leader are you? Some people lead quietly, some people lead loud, some people lead um, in their thoughts, and others lead in the way that they behave. And so when we talk about deepening pilina, connection, relationship, um, it's that time shared together, intentionally connecting, and learning to trust one another in, the, you know, in, in any space. So what is the what is this moment? And then it, are, are you connecting just for this one task, activity, or reason? Or is this someone that you're building a long relationship with? And that um, who we show up as in those moments is something that it takes practice. I mean, that's why it is a time, I don't know if you notice, but that spending time with your friends feels so precious and valuable. Like there's never, another, there's never too much time of being able to talk story, um, of being able to connect and find out more about one another. And that is probably um, one of the most important things you can do to learn to deepen Pilina, is to simply sit and be and share air with the purpose of learning the other person. Mm -hmm. So being interested to know what they offer, but also to know your own voice and how you put yourself out there. Um, those are tasks that are um, sound so easy, don't they? <laughs> it's so true. It sounds really yeah. easy, but it can be tough. And it really mm -hmm. depends. I mean, you know, um, some of the students that shared about social media, um, that's another place where people get to practice bringing out who they are. But because of that sort of idealized and distant context, um, it can have healthy, happy, very useful ways to practice. But it also, because of that sort of less accountability, that sense that you can just sort of throw anything out there and not have to be there to experience the impact mm -hmm. on the other person's face, on the other per person's ano, um, it creates a lot more opportunities where you have to practice disconnect. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that those alo he alo person to person connections really matter because there is that opportunity to mend when you misstep, right? That's one of the things that we all learn about is when we communicate. How do we, oh, I miss, oh, did I, did I make a hema hema? Okay, how do we mend? How do we make it okay with each other? It's, it's one of the most important things we do as humans is learn how to mend and keep walking from a misstep. If all we ever have are these perfect exchanges and if it's not perfect, we back off, we're never gonna get anywhere, right? The issues you all are facing today um, and tackling in the world, a lot of them are gonna require hard conversations. They're gonna require us trying really hard to connect and be understood. And so those skills of learning how to misstep with one another and mend and keep going, vital to, to what's coming next. Mahalo, and I know that you talked about um, social media and how that's affecting students now. Can we, Kate, for such young minds in middle school, you know, how is a tool as powerful as social media affecting them? And I guess we really wanted to emphasize, you know, I guess comparing ourselves to, to other people. So um, like, how does that affect them and, and their growth and development and their academics? Yeah. So I think it's so natural to compare um, in our existence. It can really um, be heightened on something like social media. And so we teach about digital boundaries. We talk so much about physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, but now in this age, especially with um, young growing bodies and minds, digital boundaries is something that we should normalize and make really, really just a, a part of the conversation about boundaries in general. And one of the things I think is super powerful is how we use our words. And so a lot of the time there's messaging to young haumana about you have to, you have to take care of yourself. You have to have this boundary. You have to do this. And I try to offer an invite, a conversation around, you get to. 
You get to turn your phone off. You get to rest. You get to decide that I'm not going to visit that site anymore. You get to decide to post that picture based off what you want to show the world, not based off the comments or the likes that are going to happen. And so just really creating that language of boundaries, opportunities to decide for yourself, and then the follow through, that it's not just as simple as I put that out there and those no, no consequences, but what might be the consequences of this behavior and what can I do to take care of myself in this digital world? same as in this tangible. I would say that tangible world, both online and in person, it's really hard to find that boundary. And sometimes they overlap. They, I think they completely overlap. Kids, their drama can happen in their lives on social media. And a lot of times, backlash, and people are talking about each other online. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sieber, I was going to ask you a question about how does that social media impact? How do you see that in students and how that affects their academic life? Mm. Another good question. You know, most of the time when we talk about social, me social media and academics, the easiest part is to talk about this right here, how easy it is, how inviting it is to just keep scrolling. Um, social media apps are designed to keep you using them. That's what they're built for. And people that study how human brains work have done a beautiful job of keeping us all just so excited to find out if that cat is going to fall off the table. <laughs> um, it's so excited to find the next new product that we must all use and call a hack and do a thing with how we make a grilled cheese sandwich. Mm -hmm. It's just part of how they're built. And so the first place that I talk about the intersection between social media and academics is kind of the obvious one, which is the hours we while away doing this can affect our attention and focus, how present we are during the school day. It can affect um, how much sleep we get at night. That's one of the biggest ones, because social media, what it does is it either has a neutral or a negative impact on our mood overall. So it either goes toward boredom or it goes toward a sort of slightly negative distress, depending on the content. Because for every funny cat video there is, there are many, many judgy, negative comments, hostility, all kinds of stuff coming. So then the more complex part, the part that's a little more nuanced, and maybe not to you guys, maybe this is obvious, is that all of those negative comments, those exchanges that happen, um, uh, one of the students talked about where you see a party everybody else went to and you weren't included, or where someone is sending you messages directly that way. Um, what it does is it vastly increases the amount of access other people have to put messages in front of your eyeballs but without the kind of accountability of being in person where there is a response and then they, that they have to hold accountability to what they've said to you. And because of that, it's kind of a one-way street right into you, and then yours is left to go, boy, this onslaught of commentary, or even the silence sometimes. I have to figure out how to process, deal with that, and know how to be okay. Oh, and by the way, I have a chem test tomorrow. And so how do we um, focus? hold our attention, stay well enough to think I'm still smart and a good person, I'm still me, and be able to focus and succeed in the academic environment is very much connected to how successful we are at muting the harsh and sometimes negative and almost always too much of social media. And so, I mean, even if it's super festive, sometimes doesn't that make you not want to study? And so um, I think we see that interaction there. The other part, though, is that we can't simply pretend it's not there and think, oh, I'm at school, that's all there is, because we have to do careful analysis of what it's doing to us in the student body. And so in many of your courses, I'm imagining you guys are having discourse about this. You're talking about it, and you're figuring out, what do we all do about it? It's designed to keep us zombied out. It is. Nice. So what do we do? We as a group who would like to be alert advocates participating in solving the challenges facing your world, which, by the way, I can't wait to see what you do with those. <laughs> can't wait. That's, that's pretty incredible. I think uh, both of us, we really think about how those, some of those middle schoolers, like mm -hmm. a lot of that, how, is, how do you think that kind of changes, Miss, Miss Kate? How does that change their, because now they're getting phones so early. How does that kind of change them as terms of what you've seen in kids, middle schoolers in the past, I know for our generation or our age, our grade, we almost were kind of transitioning into that area with some of us had social media or not. How did you see that in the middle school? It's very prominent. And I think what is important is that we try to decide how we're gonna use our power. 
There's so much power that is given to us, either uninvited by social media or that we really want to take on. And so what are the appropriate ways to express that power that might work in your benefit or might have the outcome that you want? So one of the things that I encourage Helmana to do at a young age, even adults ourselves, is to take an inventory of your social media. Look at who you're following, who's following you, and again, ask yourself that question of, how come? Why am I following these people? Why am I paying attention to these people? What is the outcome that you want? How do you want to use your power? And it should be in a lot of ways that we are confronted with, I don't know why I'm following this person. I don't know why I'm listening to this person. And if you're unsure, I would ask you to press pause on that and really be sure about the influences that you want in your life and the power that you want to influence others. So many high schoolers have this kind of character about themselves that they've figured out. The middle schooler, we're trying to encourage them to get onto that path of figuring themselves out. And if you are confused about who you are on social media, that's not gonna only live in that world. It's going to bleed out. So let's figure out your values, let's figure out what's important to you, and let's have that represented on your social media. That is so powerful. I think we see that a lot with our student body, haven't we? Just sit, all the people just talking about that, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, we've had such a great conversation, thank you so much guys, on the health, mental health issues. Here are some thoughts uh, from students on possible solutions. Some things I've done to cope with sort of these stressors in my life is to take a deep breath. Because above everything else, I know that at the end of the day, I am going to be okay and really taking a step back as an individual and sort of removing yourself from an environment that isn't healthy for you is what you need to do sometimes. And just taking that deep breath can really relieve all of the stressors that are happening to you. How I've coped was after a while, I learned to be okay in my own space. I used to be very dependent on other people. And I think playing a sport really helps me like expand my outer circle and my social circle um, because I'm able to make friends ranging from freshmen all the way to seniors. Going to God. The Lord has always like um, helped me ever since I came into Komama since seventh grade. So I feel like if we could all together take a step back and relax and realize that life is more than just an acceptance letter or more than just a good grade, or more than what your teacher or your coach will tell you, or what your peer has to say about you, then we can finally just be happy and less stressed. Here's some resources that you can access should you feel you need to address mental health issues. The most important thing to remember is that you are not alone. There are many people out there that want to help you. Thank you so much for that first segment. I really think that that's such an important thing for us to kind of get ourselves in tune to and to really have these students understand what's so important about mental health. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Uh, I know we both really are going to take this to our, um, to our own school to come back to Kamehameha and really focus on that a lot more. Uh, coming up right after the break, we'll sit down with an expert on food sustainability. We'll be right back. Aloha and welcome back to a special edition of Spotlight Now with students from Kamehameha Schools Kapalama Campus. Well, good job on the first half of that uh, interview. Uh, we learned a lot about the challenges associated with mental health. What are some of the key takeaways uh, that you got from, from that interview, Kaden? Some of those key takeaways, I thought, were for, with social media in general. We need to watch what we say and how that can really affect others and our relationship with other people online. And, and how about for you, Leonala? Um, I think something that I took away was being able to find a good safety net and support group uh, to help keep us stable. Yeah, yeah, those are lessons not just for students, but really for all of us. OK, we've done with the first half. Now the second half, uh, we are tackling the issue of food sustainability. That's right, Yunji Ryan. We really want to take a closer look at the food sustainability and what we're eating on campus. I mean, for example, on our on, at our Kamehameha Schools campus, we now eat poi and ulu daily in that lunchroom. Yeah, 
And we also wanted to promote food sustainability and food waste as well. So let's take a look at what our students have to say. We also want to promote sustainability and minimize food waste. Right now, more than 80% of Hawaii's food is imported. Boosting our food security and investing in sustainable local food systems will help support our local economy. Let's hear what our fellow students have to say about the issue. I feel like getting the word out on food sustainability could be spread in like minute ways. For example, in Akahi, with the addition of poi and specific Hawaiian fruits or vegetables, that little change influences our minds and tells us, hey, we're eating the same way we've done back then. Why can't we incorporate more ways to do so in the future and create a more green environment for ourselves? The impact Western food has on our local and Hawaiian food is definitely changing, especially because of like the new fast food restaurants that are coming in. And also just like what's popular nowadays. Like I wouldn't say Hawaiian food isn't popular, but I would say like it's very common to just have like, oh, chicken nuggets, hamburger, <laughs> french fries. Yeah. Well, I think that not many people get to experience what true Hawaiian food looks like. Not local food like uh, local mocha and that, but like true Hawaiian, like fish and poi straight to straight back to the olden times. I don't think we're quite used to eating that kind of stuff. Now, granted, there is a lot, a lot of locals who eat that way still, but I think we also need to try and get our taste buds back onto that. Joining us now is Kaneko Schultz, Executive Director of Kako Oivi. Mahalo for being here. Yeah. Mahalo for having us. Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and its mission? Yeah, mahalo for that. Uh, Kako Oivi is a nonprofit, and its mission is to perpetuate Native Hawaiian culture and practice. And we are uh, fortunate to be in Heia, in a 400 acres of land of HCDA. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So. Um, as being a, a farm, you know, trying to deepen the connection between the land and its people, and now realizing that Western influences have impacted us so much, you know, what have you noticed in, in its impact in communities trying to serve uh, their people with, I guess, lo locally sourced foods? Yeah. So I think um, when we were at KS, it was a little different back then, and as we left for college and came home, we realized that there was a a significant need for our people to activate. Um, it was right after kind of the whole uh, trustee movement and KS was in that reorganization. And so coming out of college, we were fortunate that there were people that were supportive of our abilities to um, kind of go in. And so with the creation and the support of the Civic Club, uh, creation of Pai Pai Ohe'eya, and then Kakui, we followed after that. It was kind of fortunate that we could get moving in that kind of aina and that activity. But there is still a need. It hasn't really changed. There's still a need for our people to get back on land, to produce food, to feed our people in our community. Exactly. For that need, you're talking about how much that we need people to keep perpetuating this culture. With that, with all this Western influence that we have, we so much of our diet has really been like Western foods, like rice and bread, and not how right. much of it has been local foods. Have you seen yeah. how? How much have you seen that impact of the Western foods affect the popularity of our local food? So for Pride of Hawaii, we, we should know that um, Hawaii fed basically the West Coast. Um, the food that was produced from multiple cultures yeah, was basically able to produce and feed the West Coast. And you know, after the war, there was kind of a shift from that kind of agrarian society to more of the, what you see now, which is a tourist society, which is the generations that we've grown up in. But those uh, infrastructural pieces are still there. Um, Hawaii, you know, during the pandemic, we were hoping that we could see that shift, right? I mean, you guys unfortunately got to see the beauty of Hawaii and some of the ugliness of it in terms of how we needed to feed our people and how we needed to feed ourselves. Um, and we were really uh, hopeful that we could see that kind of shift back to that. Agri I mean, I don't know about your parents, but I'm sure a lot of families started to make their own gardens, go work in the land, right? And now that the pandemic is in its new phase, everybody's going back to just the, the slug again, the, the sloth, um, the run, sorry. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of like, how do we do it? Like, what do we have to do for schools, for instance, for you guys? What, has there been a change with the food systems or is it kind of just, I mean, that's what we're talking about today, I guess, you know, okay. but yeah, anyway. I mean, I guess for us personally, a lot of the foods that we eat in our cafeterias yeah. is like, I guess we have pasta Fridays, we have um, a lot of chicken, 
you know, we have a lot of chicken, we have a sandwich bar assignment, That's good. which mean, is good. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's food that, you know, um, keeps us healthy and, and sustains our energy throughout the day. But I guess for local foods, you know, we just started inputting ulu and poi into our oh, cafeteria and so eating that. But we aren't like, we don't have as many Hawaiian food days, I guess, you know, per se. But as Kalko OVV, we wanted to know, because you, you talked about the, the shifts between, um, I guess, being hopeful and then experiencing these negative things. Like, how is Kalko OVV specifically um, working to transition into, um, you know, I guess, mitigating the influence that was, like, I guess, I like, nah, made yeah. that. Like, what are we doing now? Right? To, like, right? so, doing? so for us, it's like obviously um, multiple cultures, not just Native Hawaiian, right? And right. so we got to look at what was grown in the past. And so there was rice grown, there was bitter melon, there were different pieces growing, sunflower, corn, all of those pieces that allowed us to kind of have a really a wider palette. Mm -hmm. So, um, in areas in Aina that could grow those crops, I'm all for agriculture in general, right? I don't, I don't obviously f want to push for Hawaiian kalo, Hawaiian varieties, right? Our canoe plants. But if we can grow hops up in Waimea or we can grow other things in other places, there's no reason why you guys shouldn't be exposed to that wide range of different types of food. Um, for Heeya, for the wetland where it is, um, obviously with climate, Lo'i is pretty much what can be grown. We tried to grow other crops. You guys remember all of the different things that we grew. And climate and flooding basically um, impacted the survival rate of those things. Mm -hmm. Uwala is, is a wonderful thing to grow, but probably not in a wetland. Mm -hmm. And you know, so what the environment and what the Aina was dictating to us was Lo'i Kalo. And um, the birds, the fish, the plants, the other kanaka that they, we all thrived as Haloa was put back into the ground. You know, so, Obviously for Kako Uivi, we very much want to push for, you know, Luau, Kalo, right? Those are our, our kind of our esteemed prize things. But in other Aina, you know, I want you guys to be able to see blueberries. I want you guys to be able to see other product lines mm -hmm. that can be grown, whether our family's up in Waimea, Kauai or Hawaii Island or on Maui, you know, what, what mm -hmm. can we be grown? I, I want to make sure that you guys are given the opportunities to grow and learn mm -hmm. and experience, right? Because you are our future. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? So yeah. I really want to caution where Kakoibi stresses heavily on Hawaiian foods and stuff, but by means we support agriculture, any kind of thing that can be grown. And I stress to you guys, maybe you want to grow wine, maybe you want to grow something else. Mm -hmm. Like it's non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> no, 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 no. Anyway, for I would, juice. I would say definitely with all this demand that we have yeah. for all these foods and we want to become more sustainability. I know that there's this fear out there that if we get cut off from our, our mainland coast, we may, might only sustain ourselves for a day or two. For growing more agriculture here at home, because mm -hmm. we have such limited space on this island, how have you seen your organization tackle the amount of demand that they face getting so much food and helping to sustain our No, I mean, a uh, great question. It, it will happen in a generation when we get cut off, okay? So the issue is not so much us being cut off from the West Coast, mm -hmm. but us being cut off from Hawaii Island, us being cut off from Maui, from Kauai, right? Everybody talks about Hawaii cannot feed itself. Our cousins on Big Island probably pretty much gonna be fine. It's Oahu that really is the, is gonna be the issue, right? So for your guys' mind, is like what resources can be made on Oahu to ensure that the 90% of the population can survive, right? And, that, and that's the, I don't have the answer to that yet. I know that there are systems and there are great people within the state and the feds that are trying to think of ideas, but it's a really big concern. So for Kakuivi, with the acreage that we have, obviously we can produce a fair amount, but who's gonna harvest? the 100 acres of Lo'ikalo, mm -hmm. right? After the category three comes from the south, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it's building in those systems with the structures that we build, the facilities on the windward side to hopefully be able to get the food out. Again, like our cousins in Waimea, they're gonna be fine. It's, it's Oahu that I'm really concerned about. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't love the other island, I'm just saying, right. it's, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like yeah, that, that's the real yeah. thing. So, it's as you guys go in and know all of, all of our cousins on the other islands, it's not just as simple as Hawaii, right? It's, each island has its own kind of sovereignty and use and system. And I know that you're saying you're concerned about Oahu and I get it, you know, the industrialization on this island yep. is, has 
made a huge impact, you know, a drastic one on, on the land and our sources for us to be able to, you know, sustain ourselves. And so I just wanted to know at Kako'o Wivi, how has, you know, cultivating a traditional workspace where you, you know, continue farming and, and sourcing water been affected by the industrialization okay. of buildings, you know, this technology, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I have to give all the credit and aloha to the kupuna that, that fought to protect the, the wetlands of He'ea to what it was. I mean, there was a, a push for a power plant, mm -hmm. and that's where, like, Keep Country Country came from was actually He'ea. Um, there was obviously highest and best use practices by the landowner to develop it into another marina, and the families fought to protect that. So a lot of the credit has to be given to the, the families that um, resided to protect it. And then for our generation that came in after that, uh, that gift that they left us, now it's, you know, get the mana'o, get as best the information as we can from different resources, whether it's science, traditional culture, traditional knowledge, and trying to mix that in. So it, it has been, um, the industrialization of He'ea has been something to watch. Um, now for us, we basically take back, kind of see, you know, obviously ask the kupuna for support and help, and then moving forward with how do we build into that. Um, and the hope is that the next generation, we can teach them and give them enough of the opportunities so that you know, the mistakes that I make, um, you guys can fix it. You know, our children, our families, our nieces, our nephews can react and fix the, the problems we did. Hopefully, we left it better than we received it. Um, so yeah, so some of the issues that we've had with industrialization is basically the, the demand for certain types of products. Mm -hmm. And now that we are in the process of uh, maybe another type of Hawaiian Renaissance or another push, we hope, um, we'll see a lot more of that food development coming mm -hmm. out, yeah. But as you guys know, with economics, right, you got demand and supply, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so if you can increase demand, um, you can basically ensure that the supply goes up, and the price goes up for the farmer too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So with all these, you're talking about all these different kind of little plugs that fit into this big, gener this big whole issue on sustainability. And I think there's so many tiny little things that we need to focus on yep. to make this whole thing work as an old machine. And I think the big question for us today, what, why is sustainability in the future, both in person as physically and for us as a community, why is sustainability so important? Um, so sustainability is so important because for us as Hawaiians, there, there's really no other place for us to go. We, we can't, we cannot, go to another aina and survive as a people. It has to be here. So um, sustainability was integrated within our system, our culture, our blood, our lands. And it, it's, in, it's actually a lot more integral than you guys realize. Yeah? And so it's as, as long as we can walk that path, you know, walk the footsteps of our ancestors, that will be in itself sustainable. Uh, we need to look at now with the pressures that we see of the, the current world I mean, with the current defueling of Red Hill, the impact of the aquifer, right? Um, those are all systems that we gotta kinda understand. Um, those are tools that we've learned from different cousins, from different areas, reservoirs, water systems. We have to really look at that to preserve our water because by preserving that water system, we can basically, you know, right? where, is, where is he, where is he? Um, and so that water system is so important to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm rambling, so I apologize. No, no. no. But um, it's just, it's just kind of that, that sustainability system. So for, for your generation, for obviously, for my daughter and my son and my nieces and nephews, it's, it's basically getting out there to just try something. Mm -hmm. You know, for you all already, it's like just getting out there. And I appreciate when I see you guys getting out there just to work. Mm -hmm. And that's so important because that, um, will hopefully regenerate and reinvigorate that um, bond that we have, you know, that genealogical bond that we have to that aina, mm -hmm. to all the ainas in Hawaii. So did I answer your question? Or? Definitely. Yeah. So, no, mahalo. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I can go deeper, but I don't know how deep you guys want us to go today. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah. But going back onto industrialization, I don't see it as a horrendous thing either. I see it as a great opportunity for us to be able to feed our families. You know, if um, we're no longer the six, eight Native Hawaiians. So um, basically, as long as we can keep growing 
you know, we'll have to use machinery to do that. You know? yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Don't shy away from Instagram technology, even though I know in the first half, that is a major way that for us to improve our lifestyle mm -hmm. and our ability to just thrive. Yeah. Mahalo for those thoughts on um, the importance of sustainability and the bond between us and our land. And, you know, the people who are working towards cultivating our systems now. Um, before we continue our conversation on food sustainability, we'd like to hear from more students about the importance of this issue. So let's take a look at that. Just like religion, just like language, food is very important to our Hawaiian culture. Yeah, I like Akahi's dish, like the poi and stuff. I get that every day. Um, and it's kind of just part of my diet now. Of course, I'm eating the boy and ulu because, like, I love that. I love that food, right? Um, I think a big part of it is that it has to be like a process that you phase in. Like, I think even in a hundred years, it's like not possible to be like <laughs> more than like sixty percent sustainable. But um, even still, it's just like small things in your home, like growing gardens and stuff like that and working on that and slowly getting bigger and bigger and phasing it into our lives. Uh, I like what he's saying right there in that, in saying that we have so much of our own people making their own local gardens and really sustaining themselves. What would you say is your take on how we individually, not only can we support our, our friends who are helping us be more sustainable, but are ourselves making that impact? So, a couple things, yeah. First thing is just, just get out there. Um, like they said, put the phone down, go out into the land, whether you're in your own backyard, on a patio, anywhere, just, just get into the land, try and make something grow. That, that interaction, that aloha that you share between the, the plant or the water or the fish or whatever, just, just get out there. As Hawaiians, it's important that you guys are in that presence, yeah, presence of our kupuna. Um, in terms of demand, just requesting, I know there's a 20 by 30, uh, 20 to 30 percent green growth, um, but just demand a little bit more of the food per system. Um, and instead of having pasta, maybe make sure that the pasta is 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 um, coming from a base product that was grown in Hawaii. It can still be pasta, mm -hmm. but you know, and then be prepared for a little bit of a higher price point to support the local farmers. Um, those are some major things, just being and demanding certain food products. Mm. Um, but other than that, I would just say, just support your friends and get out there and, and malama mm. Yeah, mahalo for that. We'll definitely start getting out there. Um, but mahalo for joining us today and giving us a greater insight into food sustainability. I feel like you really gave us that better understanding of how we can make our own future better, while as also supporting our kapuna and those ahead of us as well your future. Thank you so much. I think we're going to head over to why our student voices matter and how we can be heard and what we should be hearing. Take a look at this. My voice is important to be heard because it has the power to change. Student voices are important because we are the learners of today and the teachers of tomorrow. You know, the adult should listen so we could like, become our best selves and create the best society moving forward. By having this opportunity to share my own voice, I hope that it inspires the next generation to speak up and they are heard. My thoughts are super important. Basically, we just need our voices to be heard. Hey, well, great job. So tell us, how did it feel to be this, the host today? Um, it felt really empowering, you know, to be able to get out there and speak on behalf of someone who I'm very close to and work with all the time. It felt really good to do this with him. I feel like it was so nice for us to really become that voice and really echo some, a lot of our peers' uh, concerns and also questions and really get us out there into the world and figure out what, we're, what our next steps are going to be. Well, you guys did a fantastic job and please stay tuned for more shows from the students of Kamehameha schools from the other two campuses in the months ahead. These two have set the bar pretty high. We look forward to more engaging conversations with our Hamana in the future. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, ahui ho. Aloha. <laughs>